the gunfight went on for maybe about probably about two minutes and you know everybody we're online the other bird is online plus we got minigun support what are you gonna do yeah there's no you you have no chance while this was taking place a squirter had jetted off we had already called a gun run on, on this guy he was like four or five hundred yards away so we called a gun run in little birds came in i think they hit him in the hip and in, in, in the shoulder so we weren't like super concerned with them, but we knew he was out there. So we're like, all right, while well, they're doing their thing, SSE and all this, let's go get this this guy. So me and the platoon sergeant, we head out. I cut the dog off leash and the dog gets on order. He starts making his way, making his way to this guy. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit and I serve war zone tours as an army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15 year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear the combat story of Patrick Kinsella and his five deployments with 1st Ranger Battalion to Iraq and Afghanistan. Not only do we get to hear of Patrick's first-hand combat experience, which includes nighttime raids on HVTs and MI-17 crashes, but he also gives us a glimpse into one of the most interesting and relatively unheard of group of special operators in the war the Afghan Army's Female Tactical Platoons, or FTPs. Patrick spent years fighting in Afghanistan, but found his time training and leading the brave women of the FTPs to be the most rewarding. The FTPs were Afghan women who volunteered to go through special operations training and selection programs, from basic marksmanship to fast roping to explosives training and more, and who would go out in the darkness with US Special Operations Forces on targets. Patrick continues to support the women of the FTPs who were recently evacuated from Afghanistan in 2021 to help them find a place in the U.S. and share their incredible stories. We'll share some resources in this episode to help these women who sacrificed so much for us to make a life here in the U.S. now. And I hope you enjoy this selfless combat story about so much more than just one man as much as I did. Patrick, thanks for taking the time to share your story with us today. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it. It's uh, it's good to finally see you in person. I've um, I've watched a bunch of your stuff and, and I've gotten familiar with your channel and, and I'm excited to uh, to tell my story and to, to tell the story of um, kind of some unsung heroes of uh, the global war on terror that people might not be uh, be aware of. So uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm so glad you had reached out to begin with. A very compelling story. A lot of folks reach out and uh, yours grabbed me right away. And I think people will really appreciate it. They can see the FTP um, poster behind you. And we're going to get into that, the female tactical platoons. I'd never heard of them, despite all the time I'd spent um, focused on that part of the world. So I can't wait to dig in there. But we're going to start with sharks. So just before we started recording, uh, Patrick and I were talking about his Instagram feed that I, I, came, I stumbled across a picture. And for those who um, have a chance, you should go check it out. It's basically Patrick with a giant shark in the water, no cage that I could see. So I wanted to hear what the hell you were doing <laughs> with this shark. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, um, that was taken, that was two years ago. Um, that was over on, the, uh, so I live in Southwest Florida. That was over on the, the East Coast, over in Jupiter. There's a company over there that will, uh, That'll take you out on, you can do caged dives or uncaged dives. It's called Florida shark diving. And I've always just been fascinated with sharks ever since I was a kid. I would be, you know, I was a Discovery Channel and National Geographic, uh, just nut. That's that's all I watched on television was all the wildlife stuff. So I've loved Shark Week and all that since a kid. And it's always something that I've always wanted to do. And um, yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, I, I saw a, a thing on, on Instagram and they were advertising for it. So I, you know, I went over there, they, they, uh, they take you out and they, you know, you go about maybe 20, 30 miles offshore and then they, they drop you in and it's just, they chum up the water a little bit. And then just out of the, the darkness of the depths of, you know, of, of the Gulf or, uh, of the, um, uh, of the Atlantic, these, these massive bull sharks and hammerheads and tiger sharks just start showing up. So, um, yeah, I was able to, luckily uh, the photographer was able to get that, that good photograph of me with that. It was a, uh, it was a pregnant, a pregnant bull shark. So that was, that was a lifelong thing I've always wanted to do. That thing was huge. And that, that's like a huge fear of mine. I remember I, one of the, 
the folks I'd interviewed, John McCaskill was saying like out in the middle of the ocean, like when, as a seal, like they'd be out there and you just said nothing, but it's like black below yeah. you in the water and what lurks down there. And it's that thing that looks like the size of a school bus. Um, <laughs> so was it huge adrenaline rush compared to the stuff you had done with the Rangers, which I know we'll get into. Um, yes. And yes. And no, um, I could feel my heart kind of beating out of my chest, but at the same time, you know, I'm trying to c- control my breathing because I'm not naturally a, a water guy. Um, it, the thing that was, yeah, it, it was definitely an adrenaline rush. The thing that was particularly, it would frighten me kind of in, um, in increments because, you know, you're wearing your, your, your mask and you're kind of blinded on either side. So you don't really have any peripherals. So you can see everything that's in front of you. And these sharks, you know, they're predatory animals and they know where your eyes are and where they are. So they don't, they don't really come at you from the front, you know, you, and you have a limited scope of vision. So you'd be looking over here and then, you know, you're blinded this way. And then you kind of have to turn your whole face and you turn your face and they're right. And it, you know, it, it's, it definitely, it, uh, it was, it was scary, but in, in the way that I hoped that it would, that it would be, it was, it was a great time. So for anybody that wants to go do it, go check out Florida shark diving on the East coast and Jupiter. It's, it's a, it's an awesome time. That's super cool. All right. So you obviously, you kind of alluded to being a fan of wildlife and that sort of thing as you were growing up. So were, were you kind of an adventure seeker as a kid or was it just trying to be around nature or or the wild, I guess? Um, kind of a little bit of both. I grew up in a military family. And uh, so my dad was in the Navy. So the, a lot of my time was spent at Air, Andrews Air Force Base uh, right outside of D.C. And then once he got his retirement orders, um, we settled. Uh, he ended up buying a, a place maybe like 40 miles north of there. So, you know, I bring that up because I always grew up on military bases. So when, you, you know, living on a base, I didn't have any boundaries or, or any of that stuff as a kid. My parents, they, you know, they would just let us go run wild because they knew you're on a military installation, nothing's going to happen to you. So we were always out in the woods and climbing through the, the drainage tunnels and climbing trees and messing with wildlife and doing whatever, because there was no fear of, of anything ever really happening to us. It's not really, you know, you're, you're, you're not in a threatening environment. Um, but I always did have a soft spot in my heart for, for any, you know, all, all animals, all wildlife. I love that kind of stuff. Um, and I've always been an adventure seeker. Sometimes, um, a little too troublesome. I, you know, I was, I was a, a, a troublemaker when I was a kid, but it was always like, you know, reckless kind of stuff. Never, never anything too bad, but I, I've always loved a- anything that had to do with animals. I, you know, my, I, I would put the National Geographic on and Discovery Channel. And I would just be glued to the television for an hour learning about Komodo dragons or sharks or whatever, you know, and that stuff always, you know, captivated me as opposed to long division. All right. So you grew up on Andrews Air Force Base, right? Massive complex. Uh, it sounds like your parents may have been in the military. What were they doing? My dad was, um, he was in, he was in aviation electronics. Uh, so he worked on all the computer systems and electronic systems on the aircraft. Um, you know, and over the, he was, he was in a unit, they were, um, they call them squadrons in the Navy. Um, it was called VR 53 and they were, they worked on all that aircraft over, over at Andrews. So there was, you know, there's significant aircraft over there. That's where air force one is air force two. Um, so it it was really cool. He knew all the pilots, he knew, he knew all the crew chiefs and all that stuff. And then they would always do these really cool air shows, you know, the blue angels and the thunderbirds and all that stuff. So, and, and, you know, and our house was, was right there, right next to the runway. So, we were always tied in, you know, instead of going to the air show, we would sit up on the roof and we would watch it all, you know, and uh, that's awesome. He had, yeah. He had, he had a really, he had a cool job. It got us as kids, a lot of exposure to stuff that we otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have had. That's awesome. Yeah. I remember as we were uh, leaving Afghanistan, you know, at Bagram, when you're in the tents, getting ready to go, probably not the Rangers. You guys probably don't do that, but the rest of us knuckleheads like sitting by the runway and just jets landing, taking off. Oh yeah. All day long. So loud. Yeah. So loud. You're trying to sleep and they're just every 20 minutes, they're just gone. <laughs> gone. Oh man. Okay, cool. So at, at what age do you start thinking like, all right, maybe the military is the path for me? 
Um, after high school, I kind of was bouncing around a little bit. I wasn't really doing what I, what I should have been doing. I, I tried college. That wasn't for me. Um, I, I had actually, I moved out to Oregon and I was working at, I was working at a winery out there and I just kind of, it's just kind of twiddling my thumb, my thumbs, just, you know, blowing in the wind a little bit. I, and I always knew, you know, growing up military, I always knew, I kind of always had that card in my back pocket. And when I was in my probably mid mid 20 in between 20 and 21 is when I kind of started thinking, all right, I got to get myself together and, and, and do something with my life. And right about that time, this is 2008. This is kind of like right after YouTube had, had been established. So I started seeing footage um, from the Iraq war and the Afghan war. Um, and I, you know, I just started really, really getting taking an interest in it. And uh, so I moved back, I moved back to Maryland and now at this point I had just turned 21 and that's when I kind of started the whole, the whole recruitment process going to, to go visit. Interesting. So, so your folks clearly didn't try to push you that direction. You found it on your own later. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were very happy that I did that. Um, I think initially my mother was a little bit afraid. She didn't kind of really, she knew there was a war going on, but my dad, he knew the deal. He was like, yeah, this is, you need to do this. Um, so no, they, they didn't try to, they didn't try to deter me at all. Like it. Okay. Um, why, why did you choose the army and how'd you find your way to the Rangers with presumably your old man's air force? You've been on air force bases. Why would so you leave he, that behind? Oh, he, was actually, he, he was actually in the Navy. I have a big Navy. Ah, my, okay. my brother, my brother is active duty Navy. My uncle was Navy. My dad is retired Navy. Um, but my grandfather, he was a ranger back in the day, back in, um, um, he was up, you know, like in Korea times. Um, so I had always, you know, I had heard a little bit about that. Uh, but to be honest, I, I actually wasn't considering the army at first. It, at the time I knew, you know, I was a, you know, young 20, 21 year old kid. And, you know, I had, you know, piss and vinegar in, in my veins and I, I knew I wanted to be in the infantry. So that pretty much right there, that, that kind of, it was like either Marine Corps or army. Um, so actually the first recruiter that I went to see was, was the Marine recruiter. And I went in, I heard the, everything that they had to say. And I'm like, all right, cool. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to join the Marine infantry. And as I'm walking out the door and of course, then an army guy came over and poached me and he's like, Hey man, uh, why don't you step in here? <laughs> so I was like, all right, yeah, I'll hear what this guy has to say. So I, I heard them both out and, and then, um, you know, I got all the information and I went home. It just so happened that I had a friend that, that I had went to college with. It didn't work out for either of us. I went to Oregon to go work out there and he joined the army. We stayed in contact a little bit. I knew he was in the army. What I didn't know, he was in the 75th Ranger Regiment. He was, he was stationed in Savannah, Georgia. He was in 1st Battalion. So I called him up just kind of asking him some questions, you know, Hey man, this is what I'm thinking about doing. I want to join the military. I want to join the infantry. You know, what should I do? And he just kind of started this. This is what led me into the Rangers. Obviously he's a little biased toward, towards his unit, but he started explaining the special operations side of things to me. And, you know, at that time I didn't really know much about it. I didn't know that you could come off the couch and go straight into special operations. Yeah. I thought that was like, you know, you had to be in for 10, 12, whatever years before you could do that stuff. Um, and he kind of opened my eyes and, he, you know, and once he started really, really highlighting the benefits of it, you know, you're going to get more training, better equipment, you're going to get more money. You're going to, you know, it, it was, it was a pretty easy sell. Um, you know, for example, he was saying, okay, our, like a special operations medic probably has two to three times the amount of training as a regular medic. So just right off the, right off the bat, your chances of, if you get injured, your chances of recovery and survival, they, they increase. Um, you're going to be as a special operations soldier, you're, you know, you're going to be going out at night. You're going to be under the cover of darkness. You're going to get escorted by, you're definitely familiar with these guys, the 160th sword. You're going to yeah. get, get uh, escorted by like the, Delta force of the sky, basically. Um, every you basically you're going to have every single advantage and asset on your side. And if you're going to go to Afghanistan and Iraq and go do this stuff, why would you not want that? And once he explained it to me that way, I was like, all right, well, that that's a pretty easy choice. Um, so I, you know, he had talked me into going into the Rangers. So I went, I went back to the Army recruiter and 
And I, uh, I told him that I wanted an, an 11 Bravo uh, infantry contract with, with an option 40, which gives you the, it gives you the, um, it's, it's basic. Um, at the time they called it OSA. It was one station unit training. It's basic training, uh, AIT, and then uh, jump school. And then it gives you a, it doesn't guarantee you a slot in the Ranger Regiment, but it, it guarantees you a slot to try out. So yeah. that's, that's what I did. That's awesome. So just going back to something you said, like you knew you wanted to be infantry at the very beginning of this, where did that come from? Um, I just, I don't know. I, I've always, as you, I still apparently still have this, this thing in me, you know, with the sharks, like I've always yeah. just really enjoyed pushing the boundaries and, and kind of testing myself. And at that time, that was kind of like, I was starting to, I was at the age, it was like a coming of age time for me where I was starting to become a man and I wanted to kind of test myself in a hostile environment. And I didn't, there's a lot of cool jobs you can do in the, in the military, but in my head, at least I was like, all right, I'm going to be in the infantry. And you know, that, that's, that's what, yeah. that's where my head was at at the time, you know? Okay, great. No, it makes total sense. So you go through this like one station training and you pipeline into the regiment, which, you know, can't be an easy pipeline. I know I've talked to so many folks about how hard that is. Once you get in, how, I mean, presumably we're, we're talking like 2008, 9, 10, you, you said, right? So this is like the it's, height of the war. Yeah, I, I graduated RIP. This is actually pretty cool. I've had a lot of like cool dates throughout my military career. I graduated RIP on July 2nd. Uh, 2009, which my was which, which was my 22nd birthday, uh, so that was that's the best <laughs> birthday I've ever had. So I got the tan beret and all that stuff, and it that's was really awesome. Cool. But we're talking like mid 2009 is when I finished that pipeline. Okay, so the war is on in two two places, obviously, just going strong. Um, how long is it until you're out in downrange? Uh, so after I graduated RIP, they sent me and a handful of guys to Savannah. When we showed up, we're talking now it's probably the end of July. Um, and I didn't know what any of this terminology meant when I got there, but we showed up and, and the LNO was like, Hey, everybody's on pre-deployment block leave right now. And I'm like, all right, you know, cool. Whatever, whatever that means. Um, well, what it, what it meant. And I found out later is you're going overseas in like three weeks. As soon as these guys get back, they're, they're on leave right now because they're getting ready to go. So I, we arrived in, uh, at the end of July. And I think my first deployment was to, I was in Tikrit, which is, uh, like central Iraq. It's, uh, it's a little bit North of Baghdad. And I, I, I was over there maybe three weeks later. Jeez. And again, that, that was another selling point that, that my friend Sean had told me when he was trying to talk me into going a special operations route is because, you know, I, I was 20, a lot of people join when they're 17, 18, 19, I kind of felt like I was a little bit behind the curve and I wanted to get downrange as soon as possible. And he was, he, he was in Savannah. So he knew the deployment schedule and he was like, Hey man, if you join right now, the way it worked, he was like, you'll be in, you'll be deployed by the end of the year. And cause I was kind of leaning hard towards the Marine Corps. And he was just, he was explaining the whole thing to me. And he yeah. was like, listen, man, I can guarantee you, you're going to deploy within a year. And he's like, I know guys that have, you know, I know guys in, in the Marine Corps that, you know, it, it might be two years until their next deployment. So if you really want to go, this is where you should go. And he ended up, you know, he was right. He was right. <laughs> <laughs> how, how hard was it kind of being accepted in that type of unit as the brand new, like right out of training guy? Who's, who's also like four years older than everyone else. So you probably take it from, from both the young guys who are 18 and then the folks who have now come off of like their fifth deployment by that time. Yeah. So like my, my team leader, I think my team leader, like you said, he was on like, he was a E5. So he was on his fifth rotation, Jesus. but he had, he was 21. So, you know, it's like, okay, it's a guy younger than me. And now he's trying to get me prepared. He's doing you know, you have all that checklist stuff you have to go through before you leave. And he's like trying to tell me about my finances and this and all that. I'm like, dude, I know what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Um, but no, it was not, it was not easy. They, uh, they torture you. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they, they torture you. And they had just gone through, you know, an eight month train up training cycle and then they're on leave. So everybody, you know, everybody's jacked up. They're in that mindset, getting ready to deploy. And then they show up back to the unit and they had, I think it was maybe like eight or nine of us. And now there's all this fresh meat right there. And they just, the learning curve is very, very steep. 
And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's like a job interview every day, basically for your first year or year and a half or so that you're in until you get sent to ranger school. And they just, they're training you, they're doing it. I mean, everything they're doing is for a reason, but it's just brutal. They, there's, they torture you, (laughs) (laughs) but I love, you know, that's all part of it. You know, that's, I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change it for the world. So, so once you're downrange, those deployments, are they like four months? I can't remember for y'all. Yeah, it's typically you're going to do like a seven, seven month, seven or eight month train up cycle. And then, uh, and then a pre-deployment two week leave. Then you're going to go on a four month rotation okay. and you're going to go on a two week, uh, post-deployment leave and then rinse and repeat. God. Yeah. And I know, and I know you rinse and repeat. So if, if you take us to the first one, literally like you're three weeks out of training, you're downrange with first battalion, right? Yes. Into crit. Like what can you talk us through the first op you went on? If you remember it, like, what was it like for you? I do remember it actually. A lot of people have like these cool, sexy stories of their first. Mine was most don't, man. Those yeah. most don't. Mine was so embarrassing. Um, so the very first target that you know, I, I actually didn't go out on target for like three, the first three, four weeks that we were there because they were still, you know, taking me to the shoot house every day um, and catching me up to speed. Interesting. Yeah. You know, like you know, you're downrange, but they're like, hey, we don't trust you yet. You still got to train with us. So they would go out on target at night. And I'd be back in, you know, I'd be back at the base, you know, doing private stuff like jock duty or cleaning weapons or whatever. And then when they would get back, they would take us, you know, then they would run us through the shoot house. They'd run us to the roping towers and all that stuff. And then after a couple of weeks of that is when I got, you know, you had built rapport with, with the team. They trust you. So I got to go on my first, uh, my first operation. And it was, it was it, well, it was like the first couple of minutes were really embarrassing. After that, everything was fine. But what ended up happening is we hit a target that was kind of like, uh, I don't want to say in the suburbs of Tikrit because, you know, there's, I mean, I guess it was, it was on the outskirts of Tikrit. And then we had like a 25 minute flight, maybe like a 30 minute flight to where we were going. This is and at I'm night, like, right, Patrick? I mean, yeah, you guys just yeah, operate. Right. Yep. Yeah. And I'm the brand new private. So of course they're just like, you know, we're, we're on Blackhawks and you can fit maybe like eight, nine, 10 dudes fully kitted up and I'm the new private. So they're just like shoving all the litters and they're like, get on the ground private. You know what I mean? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm all, you know, kind of balled up on the ground with, with all this weight on me. And the way that I had sat down, my knees were like, you know, tucked underneath my legs. So long story short, I had lost all the blood flow to my legs but on this flight. My legs had gone completely numb. So we touched down in this kind of like overgrown field. Um, we were doing, I think we were doing maybe like a 1K infill to the target. So we touched down maybe like a, like a kilo out, or like a click out. And um, I couldn't feel my legs. So when I went to step off the bird, I couldn't feel where the ground started and my feet stopped. So I step out of the bird and just collapsed on the ground. And my, you know, everybody's pouring out of the bird because, you know, you're in a really compromised position at that point, you know, and my team leader is, you know, now he's standing over me. He's looking at me and he's like, what the, what are you doing? You know, and I'm looking up at him like, oh, no. You know? And uh, it was, it was super embarrassing. That was the first thing that, that I did ever on target. Um, oh, God. Obviously, I ended up redeeming myself, but they never let me live that down. Oh man. All right. So like after you get up and you, and you head to the target, can you kind of talk through, this is your first time down range. I mean, probably six months before that you weren't even in the military, you know, like you had just joined up. What did that feel like in, in that first um, night? That was, I remember it kind of was, it was a lot less, it was a lot less sexy than the movies had showed. It was like, it was a lot of like, everything is real slow and everything's quiet. There's, you know, um, I was out of position a lot of times. So, you know, I'd be going, I'd be heading off in a direction. I'd see a laser going my way where they're, you know, they're trying to bracket me back on where I'm going. Um, it, that was a, that was an uneventful, uneventful mission. You know, we hit touchdown jackpot. We got the guy we were going after, but there was no rounds fired on that night, but that was a really, it, the, the, the learning curve was really steep. You know, they were, they're constantly watching you. And, you know, my tab spec four, he's, you know, he, he was on me the whole time. So anytime I was out of position or if I was looking a certain way, I wasn't supposed to be looking They're they're on you the whole time. And I remember, I do remember, I do remember thinking like, okay, there is no room for error. Cause if I do, Anytime I, I do anything wrong, 
They see it. They're on it. And then you pay for it when you get back to the base. They just crucify you. You know, wow. and, but they're doing it in a, in a learning way, but they're just, it's all physical punishment. Um, oh man. So that was that I remember it being, it was, you know, it was cool. It's what I thought it was going to be, you know, you're creeping in at night and it's all yeah. that, but it wasn't like, like the movies where there's gunfire going Explosions. everywhere. Yeah. It wasn't that. And I remember being like, Hmm, like, all right, I can do this, you know? <laughs> hey, so you mentioned like you'd, you'd see a laser to get you back on course if this is too sensitive and we can't talk about it, no worries. But could you speak more to that? Like, wh- what is it that somebody's using to point you back? Who is it that's watching you do this? What What is that laser? Yeah, it's just, it's nonverbal communication. Um, so you have your, your LA-5, you know, it's your infrared laser on your weapon system. And we use it to communicate with each other a lot. So, for example, if, if you're going around a corner, before you go around a corner, you'll laze that corner. And if there's somebody on the other side of that corner, they'll laze back. And now you guys know without talking to each other, you know, hey, there's a, there's a friendly on the other side of this. So you use your lasers to talk to each other a lot. So, you know, if I was kind of veering off course a little bit, I would see a laser in my direction and they would kind of like circle around me and then push me back. Hey, and basically they're saying, hey, bro, go this way without having, you know, they're not yelling, hey, you know, yeah. And it's just nonverbal communication with an infrared laser. That's really cool. Okay. And then you mentioned coming back and getting critiqued basically on what just ha- critiqued is probably a soft word for it. But I think this is what people envision or imagine that special ops does better than anyone, which is like really correcting mistakes quickly and, and efficiently, especially at that point in the war where they'd had years to, to progress. When you come back, is it like you sit down and they talk through, Hey man, when we were moving on the target, you did this. What is the debrief like, or is it just, Hey, get out there and do pushups? Um, it, it kind of depends. It depends what your mistake was. If you did something stupid, then yeah, you're going to, it's going to just be torture. If you did something re- you know, reasonably like a reasonable mistake for a new guy, they're going to, they're going to correct it in a professional manner. Um, it's always going to involve some sort of physical, physical pain or physical education. Um, education. That's good. But, but it's, it, it's done in, in the context of growth. So, you know, like if you left something behind, like if you left a litter at a doorway, instead of, you know, bringing in, you know, that's, that's a big deal. You're going to get punished big time for that. But if you, you know, if you were kind of exposed a little bit more than you should have, you know, Hey, you took this corner and, but really it would have been tactically would have been better if you had done this, they're going to break that down for you. And they're going to tell you why, why what you did was wrong and why what they're saying is right. Um, and it's just every day they're, they're just, they're, they're just pushing you and, and the learning curve, it's very steep. Um, but they, they do, they do a really good job of it. It's just, especially for those first like 18 months that you're in, you don't have any downtime. There's no, I mean, yeah, you get your sleep, but there's no, like you, you have no downtime. You are constantly like, you better be, you better be in the ready room, cleaning your weapon, uh, zeroing in your sights. You better be doing, um, you know, dry fires with your weapon. You better be setting up glass houses and practicing shoot houses. You better it's you, you have to train nonstop and that's how they, they catch everybody up so quickly. That's really cool. Can you, you know, because, just, uh, because yeah. it, you know, you're coming straight off the couch. Like, you know, it's not like dev grew in Delta. These guys have been doing it for years. You know, you're taking a guy, like you said, six months ago or nine months ago, I was hanging out at my house and now I'm with a tier two unit. So they, they, they got to catch you up real quick and they do a great job of it. Yeah. And I think that's what they're known for, right? Like that's how they get, to that level. Can you talk a little bit more just before we jump into another um, mission, but the ready room um, for aviation had its own version of this. I'd be curious what it looks like for you. I, I was around a, a tier one unit when I was at the agency and got to kind of see what I thought was a ready room. But when you say that, what is it? Uh, it's typically going to be like a, um, how would I explain? How would, depending on what fob you're at at this, at this time I was on fob spiker. And it was pretty much, it's a wooden building, maybe, I don't know, probably, probably 40 feet wide, maybe 80 feet long. And then it's just like plywood lockers, basically. Lockers. Yeah. Um, so you're going to have all your, you know, your rifle and your kit is, and everything is going to be up top. And then it's going to be separated 
and then your 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 rucksack and all your all your stuff is going to be below that. In the middle, there's going to be big big tables for. Um, that's where we build our charges. Uh, that's where you're going to store all the grenades and all that stuff, crew serve weapons and stuff like that. But yeah, it's basically just like just a big wooden building. Uh, you know, maybe first platoon will be on this side, second platoon will be on this side, and a big shared table in the middle. I will say because aviations is not that cool, and I remember with this tier one unit when I was walking around, it's like. It's like an NFL locker room. I mean, it's not as nice because it's downrange, but it's like yeah. everybody's got their stuff set up a certain way. Yep. Some really sweet gear. I just thought it was so cool to see kind of firsthand. Yeah. And you, and and that's the cool thing about the, well, one of the, I guess, cool, depending on how you look at it. I always thought it was cool. The one cool thing about the Ranger Regiment is, is it's exactly that. It's regimented. Like you don't get to choose how you're, it's like, that's how you're going to set your ah, life. It's going to look like that. And the reason why it's going to look like that is because of X, Y, and Z. Um, so everything is like you're saying, it's uniform. It's, it's, it, it just looks clean. It's organized. So anybody can run into anybody's locker and they know exactly where they're going. If they got to grab this, that, or the third, you know? Damn. So on that deployment, Maybe could you take us to the first time where you were kind of like, damn, this is for real. Like this is getting hairy. If that happened, I'm assuming yeah. with first battalion that happens often, but what was that first one like for you? Yeah. So our platoon went after, um, some target. I don't remember exactly what the, you know, I was, again, I was a young private, so they don't really tell you much information. You're just, you're just a, a body. Um, we were going after some target in, in, um, I want to say, I think it was in Beji. Beji is like a little bit north of Tikrit, maybe. I want to say it was up in Beji. And uh, we did, it was maybe like a 4K, 5K infill. We got, we get dropped off and we're infilling to the target. And there was a, um, an Iraqi police checkpoint that we had to go through. So we send the interpreter up there to go do deconfliction. Interpreter goes up there. They do their thing with each other. Hey, you know, don't fire at us. We're, you know... Uh, coalition forces are coming through here, you know, the whole nine. So they, we, they do their deconfliction and then we start walking in, in, into the village. And this is kind of like, it is, it's, it's on the outskirts of the city. So it's, it's kind of an isolated village, but it's definitely a little populated, kind of a populated area. Uh, there was maybe like, you know, there was a couple fields off to the, to the, um, maybe like the target, you know, say the target compound was, you know, maybe on like the north side of this village the whole like Northwest side was all fields and irrigation ditches and everything like that. And then, and then everything else was located like South and Southeast of that. So we go through the checkpoint kind of on the Western side, like heading, heading West now cutting to start going up North. And the target that we were going after, they, they had an early warning network, which we later found out was the Iraqi police. So obviously they had those. Guys <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so as soon as we go through the checkpoint, we start getting into to the ORP, which is, you know, it's the objective rally point. Everybody, you know, we're all going to meet here. And then, you know, white side's going to break off and go this way. You know, black side's going to break off and go this way. And we're going to start isolating and containing the target before the, before we assault it. Um, they, they, they had an ambush set up for us. And um, th that, that was, that was my first experience with it. It was, um, I've actually listened to another one of your one of your episodes where somebody talks about this because I've actually when when I tell the story a lot of people don't believe me and, and I'll tie everything together. Um, this was kind of looking back on on events in my life. This I'm not like a really religious guy, but this was kind of one where I'm like, all right, whoa, you know, there's something something going on here. So we're taking fire from from a couple different you know elevated positions, and my platoon sergeant he a round came through it it uh it hit his nods you know so it's it's inches away from his head it hits his nods and you know it fragments his nods you know so he was wearing his eye pro right so his eyes were protected but he got uh he had shrapnel from the nods you know you know all over his cheeks and, and his forehead and i can't remember the name of the guy that you were talking to but he had the similar thing happen to him with a round you know the angle that it came in it hit the inside of his helmet and it traveled around and yeah. back out the front and it left a burn mark all the way around. Um, there was another Jim, guy you were talking to. Jimmy about. Settle. Yeah. The yeah, a yeah. PJ who got shot through the helmet. Yep. Yeah. And that, so that in and of itself, so that, that, that was crazy. My team leader, and, and this is the, and we're talking inches here. My team leader 
he a round went through he lost the top chunk of his ear so we're talking centimeters you know and then he had he had a like your biker helmet on that you not biker helmet no not necessarily it just maybe i i I don't know if it was maybe the the angle that he was at or the you know it might have ricocheted or whatever but instead of hitting him in the head it took off that top part of his ear um he's actually he's up at he's up at cag now he was a He's a, like, he's a tactically sound guy. Um, so I doubt he was out of position, but you know, somebody was looking out for him. And then my tab spec four, he was my E4 that was in charge of me. He, he got hit pretty, he got hit pretty good. He got hit in the legs and, uh, he ended up, we casavac him out all that stuff. And he ended up getting an infection in, in Germany and they had to, they had to amputate his leg. Uh. Um, but so, so that was, that was my first thing of like, Oh, sh- like this, okay, this is not, this is not a joke. So it kind of came in, in, in two waves. So, so that happened and, you know, you know, we're taking effective fire from elevated positions when I'm, long story short, we pull back into the field and we just, we called in a hellfire and dropped the whole building. Um, we, we RTB back to the base and I don't know what I was expecting. Like, I kind of was like, oh, like the military, they're going to take care of everything. It's all like, they'll get his kit and they'll get his stuff or whatever. And I didn't realize like, no, you have to do it. You know, you're the private, you or whatever. And after, you know, I got assigned that I'm like, oh yeah, of course I'm the one that's, that's got to do it. So myself and the other private, they were like, hey, you guys, you're going to go, you got to clean his kit, get all the blood and get everything off his uniform, scrub it down, you know, whatever. So we're getting these like powdered, <clears throat> Like powdered laundry detergent things and we're like kind of scrubbing his kit and doing all that and uh we take I, I took the plates out of the front of his kit and you know you have your, your front that's facing kind of you know towards the enemy and then you have the side part that's you know what like an, you know it's like an inch or an inch and a half thick and when i took the plate out it was around not in the front of it it was lodged in the side of it so again we're talking if it was another inch and a half back it would have been in his heart uh, or at least for sure in his lungs. And so that, you know, there was three of them that all had somebody, had somebody looking out for them. And um, that was, that was like the first wave of it hitting me. And then when we, when we redeployed back to the States, you know, he was up at Walter Reed uh, doing his, you know, he was still under a lot of anesthesia and surgeries and all that stuff at that time. And I, you know, I lived right up near there. I lived in Maryland. So when I went up to go, now I'm, I'm back in the States and I went to go get my car and, and all my belongings to then officially move to Savannah. Um, I stopped at Walter Reed to go see him. And that place was eye opening because I got to see, it's, it's not just him. There's all kinds of double amputees, you know, quadruple amputees. And that's when I kind of was like, you know, all right, this is, you're playing with fire here. Do you think you would have, like, if you had gone and done that visit two years prior, do you think you still would have gone in the military? That's a really good question. Um, I probably would have, because I, I I always did think that I was going to join the military, but I I might've went a different route. I might've went, I I, I was always fascinated by, by, um, the medical stuff. Maybe I would have been, but I mean, you still would be, you'd still be involved in it as a medic, but I kind of, um, I, I, I used to like, I liked the Coast Guard a lot. Maybe I would have done that. I, I used to, I used to, um, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done, but that I probably, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't think I would have. I, I probably would have gone and done something, maybe like a search and rescue or, or something like that. Yeah. That's, that's a heavy, that's heavy to see. I would say something like that, especially when you know you're about to go down range again, when you're in the Ranger battalion yeah, in the regiment, just going over and over. Yeah. We actually got surged. Uh, you know, normally you have like six, seven, eight months, up, about eight months off into your next deployment, but we got surged on our next rotation. And so we were only back for like four months. Oh God. And then you go to Afghanistan next, right? Yeah. My next deployment was to Northern Afghanistan. I was up in Conduz and uh, that was in, we got back from Iraq in December of 2009. And then I was in, it was, so it was five months later. We went like May 1st, we went to, to Afghanistan. Jeez. And then that's, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, you do, you end up doing four rotations to Afghanistan, right? Yeah, I did one in Iraq and four to Afghanistan. Okay. So we're kind of getting onto your Afghanistan side here. Um, as you go down range there, I 
presumably you're not a private anymore. You're a little. You've, no, I was. Uh, yep, I was still a private. I was a private first class, and um, uh, at this point, I was a grenadier. I was. I uh, I was no longer a rifleman. I mean, you're still pretty much a rifleman, but then you just you know you have a, a 320 like slung on your side and like a shotgun sling. So I was a grenadier on that rotation. I actually left halfway through that deployment because I got a slot for ranger school. Um, so they sent me back home on wow. that rotator, and that that's when I went to school. Jeez. Okay. Well, how was that deployment before you got pulled? Was it was it quieter cool. than Iraq? That was a really fun deployment. So we were actually we were with uh, so there was a Delta. Uh, it was a Delta team up there. Uh, so we got to work with those guys and there was the FBI HRT team up there, which I didn't even know that was a thing. That's so awesome. that was, that was really cool. Get to get to meet those guys. And now, you know, now you're doing training with these, these top level tier one guys. Um, we were splitting our time between Kondus and Mazar Sharif. And we were just doing, um, same thing. We're doing raids. We were doing vehicle interdictions and all that, but you know, we're doing it with a, with a, with a, much higher caliber um of personnel actually i had um probably the scariest thing that happened to me in my military career was at was on that rotation and not around was fired um let's hear it man i'm, I'm <laughs> curious it was it was a really really cool deployment so we weren't even using we were using little birds and we were using 60s a little bit but it was mostly little birds and uh, you're probably familiar with them. They're MI-17, the Russian birds. Yeah. I The reason they told us we were using those is because they, they're quieter, apparently, I guess. Um, so th that's why we were using them. And we we did a, a remain over day operation um, over in Conduz. So we hit this target. You know, we infill, we hit it at night. And and then we stick, you know, we, we, we bag this guy up and we do whatever we got to do. And then we stayed over the period of daylight until the next night, uh, you know, basically to, he's not going to answer his phone or do any of that. So all of his, all of his buddies are going to come to check on him. So you can turn one target into five basically. Right. Um, and then we exfilled the following night. Well, they had resupplied us with speed balls. We had, you know, these, these rucksacks, you know, filled with ammo and water and food and whatever. So, so a bird came and resupplied us. We had all this extra weight that we didn't have. Plus we had all these detainees that we didn't come there with. And, um, so, and now we're on the second night. And so these birds come to pick us up and, so, you know, we, we get out in PZ posture, the bird comes in and we load the bird and no, no, no rounds were fired on, on that whole, that whole, you know, whatever that 24 hours we were out there, so we get on the bird and we start taking off and, uh, it didn't have enough. I don't know if it would be like horsepower or, power, or, power. or what, yeah. yeah, I don't know the, the term, I guess power. Cause we yep. get up, we start getting up to altitude and then the, the pilots, they came over the radio and they're like, Hey, we're, we're, we can't sustain this. The bird is going down. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So they did a, they, you know, this isn't like a crash landing, like, you know, like Roberts Ridge or extortion 17 or yep. anything like that, but they, they come over, they're like, Hey, we're going to do a controlled crash landing. And they did a great job. So they, they crashed us down in this field. Um, luckily nobody was seriously injured. I think, a, a lot of a lot of us you know got tbis but now we think there was a couple broken bones but the pilots did a, a great job um so now we're like sitting ducks out in the middle of this field and this was like this is the time where you kind of look at your team and your squad leader and you're like tell me what to do you know and and to their credit they they knew exactly what to do so you know everybody pours out of the aircraft we try to get away from it a little bit because, you know, it's a, it's a big target. You know, if somebody wanted to fire an RPG at it or whatever, you don't want to be right next to it. So we're pulling security all around it and the team leaders and squad leaders, they're with the pilots and the crew chiefs. And they're in there with like holy tools, like stripping all the electronics and breaking everything out of it and you know, <laughs> sense that stuff out of it. And um, the, the, the RTOs, they're partnered up with the interpreter and they're, they're starting to get chatter on the radios where they're saying, you know, they're, these guys are like, Hey, the Americans are down, they're down in this field and they're trying to, now they're trying to mount a counterattack. And I remember just kind of, you know, so they're relaying this information to us and I always felt secure and safe on target because we had the advantage. We were dictating the way that things went. And now I'm, you know, we're in this situation where, um, not so much, you know, this isn't supposed to be happening right now. 
now we're in we're in their area they're on the offensive and we're we're on the defensive and I was I wasn't used to that and uh I had read the book Lone Survivor before I maybe in like 2007 um and I remember just kind of thinking like dude like am I about to be in, involved in something where we all get overrun and every one of us dies by like 200 Taliban coming here, you know? And, and luckily, luckily that didn't happen. They, they spawn up a CV 22 surprisingly from, I think it came from all the way from Bagram. Um, they had a CV 22 come from Bagram to come pick us up. Um, but you know, you're, you know, your team leader and squad leader, they're putting you in, they're giving you your sectors of fire and they're like, Hey, if you see anybody coming, you know, PID a weapon and drop them. And I'm thinking, I'm like, dude, this can't be happening right now, you know? And uh, luckily the bird came, it got us in time. We, we exfilled and then, uh, then the air force was on station and, and they, uh, they dropped a 2000 pounder on it and blew it in place. Jeez. Hey, so you said you, some of you got TBIs, like how hard did you hit? We hit pretty hard, but they had, they did it in a way that I, I don't know how they did it, but they, the, the aircraft was, it was completely just, it was destroyed but it was, you know, it's not like we were up at like thousands of feet of elevation. I think we were probably only at like maybe like 90 or a hundred feet. You know, we had taken off oh, and, all right. and yeah. we were starting to go up. And then that's when they were like, Hey, we're going down. And, and, and they put us down. So it's not like we were like screaming in, in, into, into the ground, you know? Yeah. Oh, wow. And then, um, what was that experience with Delta like for you? I mean, for many people, they'll never come across that type of unit. You got to get into, into action with them, probably just see how they operated. Was it like a, another level of, of performance? Like some yeah. people have in mind. Yeah, we, they're, those guys are intense. I mean, their training is, it, it just takes everything to a new level. And, and when you're around those guys, you have to be a sponge. And the cool thing about them is they, they, they want to teach you, you know, they don't, they don't look down on you. Like, Oh, he's, he's like, whatever. They're like, they love that you're enthusiastic and you want to learn. So if you're like, Hey, you know, uh, I noticed that you do this with your weapon and do whatever, you know, why they're like, Oh, cool. Let me tell you why. Um, and they, they, they're very eager to teach you. And those guys are masters at what they do. Um, I had a couple people from my platoon, my, my team leader, my squad leader, a, uh, I think maybe like four or five guys from my platoon ended up going up there. So, you know, there, there, there's a lot of Rangers up there. So they have a soft spot in their heart for the Ranger battalion. So if you want to learn, they'll teach you. And uh, that was cool. We got to do all the cool, like sexy guy stuff that you see on TV where you're like coming in on little birds and you're hanging out the side of it and all that. And that, that was, <laughs> that was, it was a good time hanging out with those guys. Is that the most fun flight when you're sitting on the pod of a little bird? Yeah, yeah you can't, you know, you're, you're clipped in and all that, and you're sitting on that skid and it's, that's when you're kind of like, all right, I'm a cool guy. <laughs> this is the real <laughs> deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah, no, that was, that, that was cool. And then same thing with the FBI HRT guys. Like I said, I didn't even know they existed. Um, and you know, I was confused when I first found out they were there, but come to find out that the reason why they were there is to like, if we had rolled up some like, serious hvts they were there to preserve evidence to um and get everything back to the states where it could be you know brought to to the justice system you know in the correct way that like the, the fbi needs it to be yeah. as opposed to a bunch of dumb infantry guys like oh <laughs> you know yeah no i i know what you're talking about especially on the agency side we work so closely with the bureau and when it's a case they're like, don't even touch it, guys. You're going to ruin it. <laughs> Just let us have it. So would they go on target with you guys, Patrick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. They actually did. Uh, they would do most of the bit TQ, the battlefield interrogation and tactical questioning. They they were they were doing a lot of that stuff. Oh, that's got to be their thing, right? Yep. I mean. Yep. But they're, uh, they're just as slick on that Battle Drill 6, clearing buildings and all that. They, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, I know they, those guys train with, with DevGuru. They train with Delta. They obviously they work with Rangers. Not so much us, but they train with those Tier 1 units. So they're, they're capable. And then they, they know how to, like I said, they, they know how to do the questioning and evidence preservation where, you know, us, we're just kind of like meatheads. <laughs> you know, <that> are, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know. Um. 
let's before we transition over to FTP, could you take us to just maybe one of your other deployments, one of the tougher or memorable moments that you that you think back on sometimes that you experienced? Can be any of those deployments that we just talked through, or maybe some of the three others we hadn't touched on. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, there's well, there's two. I'll touch on one real quick. Yeah. I saw I saw in one of your interviews you were in. I'll, I'll talk about this real quick, and then I'll go into my last deployment. I saw that you were at Salerno in 2008 when it got attacked. Yeah, yeah. I was in 2012 it? when it got attacked. Yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> I think on Instagram you had like a video of that attack yeah. in 2012. Yeah, that was yeah. a serious bomb that went off there. Yeah, it. Uh, we were in the middle of our sleep cycle when that thing happened, and we we thought a, a mortar landed in our room. Uh, everybody did. Everybody, and whether you're in a chow hall or the MWR or in your room, everybody thought they got hit with a mortar. And then come to find out, you know, it was it was it was a big bomb. But I was watching your story, and you were like, "Yeah, we're running out to the helicopters under fire," and you know, they oh, hit man. you guys at night. They hit us during the day. So yours is like got to be even more chaotic, you know? It's chaotic because you got a bunch of slow fat aviators running from the chow hall <laughs> to their aircraft <laughs> we never see fire coming in this close usually we're behind some uh some type of cover in the aircraft so yeah no it was interesting yeah. artillery unit covering the perimeter and then you got chapman next door and like all the folks rolling out of there to get in the action i'm sure now, when you were there in, in 08 was the was the chow hall the same in 2012 the chow hall was straight across from the tarmac pretty much i mean there was like the hesco yeah. berries in that road but then the tarmac was right there it's the same back then yeah same. you guys ran right right to the birds no, well no because our birds were so it was adjacent the chow hall was adjacent to the tarmac but like the aircraft were on the complete other side okay so like we'd had we had to move we're all aviators. We don't run, man. I mean, like we had to get all our stuff and get out there and they had like little gators to drive us up. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a serious movement for us that time. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I, um, when I, I was watching that, that interview when you were doing it with the team house and they were asking you about it and I was like, Oh man, we got something in common. Yeah, no, for sure, man. Um, but to, to fast forward a little bit, my, like I said, I did, I did five, um, war was kind of starting to die down maybe around like 2013 and my my last rotation was i was a canine handler at this point after, so after i got back i did i did uh i did that condus rotation i came home mid rotator and then i went to ranger school then i did another rotation to kandahar when i got back from kandahar um i went to to the, to the canine platoon and I did two rotations as that. So my last rotation was in. Sorry, sorry, Patrick, can I ask, was that by choice? Like, or, or was it just, Hey, we need a canine handler or does this kind of go back to your love of kind of being outdoors? I, I loved dogs and our platoons canine handler. He had, he saw that me, he's myself and another guy, we had taken a lot of interest in it. So he was taking, excuse me, he was taking time to, to train us. And on that rotation, we had employed the dog a lot. And I was like, I was getting to watch, you know, in my head, I'm like, all right, every time something goes down, these dog handlers, they're always, they're, they're at the front of the formation. So anytime something pops off, they're right up there. If there's a squirter taken off from the building, they're going after it. Like these guys get a whole nother weapon system attached to their hip and they get to, um, they get to, they're right in the middle of everything. And I just saw it as another way for me to like, just, it's just another way to become more lethal. And, and I've, I'd already mastered the, the automatic weapon, the rifle, the, the grenade, that whole thing. So I was like, all right, let me, let me go learn this. Cool. Um, so that, that's why I decided to go do that. Okay. Got it. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. So my last rotation, I was in uh, Helmand province. We were at Fob Bastion and this, this would have been, this was in, um, this was early 2013. So I think we got over there like maybe February 1st, somewhere right around there. So it's still kind of cold. You know, you're in Southern Afghanistan, so it's not like you're up in the Hindu Kush, but you know, the fighting season takes a dip during the cold. Yeah. And then also at, at that time of the war and, and in Helmand province, the Taliban was kind of laying low, you know, they're, you know, they have that saying like, um, you know, you have the clocks, but we have the time. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, they just, you know, they were kind of laying low as, you know, as we can see of what just happened, they, they, they were laying low. Yep. Um, so it was a pretty slow rotation. 
we had only gone out like a handful of times. And then uh, on April 13th of that year is when the Boston Marathon bombing happened. And we're all downrange and, you know, we're, we're watching all that take place. And we're just like, you know, I was born in Boston. My, my, my dad's first uh, duty station was a, a Naval Air Station Weymouth. It's right out, right outside of Boston. So I was born in Boston in general. And there's, you know, there's guys in my platoon that are from Boston. So, you know, we're all watching this go down. And now we're on this slow rotation, you know, so we're itching, we're trying to get after it. And we're watching this stuff go back on the States and, you know, this, this mass cal event. And we're like, you know, everybody's getting real fired up. And uh, they had been working, the Myco had been working on a target. And the, the, the target came down. It, came, it actually came down that night, but weather rolled in. So we, uh, the mission got canked that night. And then, and then weather rolled in the, the following night. So it got canked again. I think on, I think it was like the third or fourth night of that like manhunt where they're out like looking for the, for those two guys. Uh, we met trigger and it was, there was a compound out in Lashkar Ga, which is maybe like 25, 30 minute flight. I think from, from Bob Bastion, it's a pretty like pretty historic, like fighting area of, of Southern Afghanistan. It, you know, it's, it's in like a little river basin. And uh, it was maybe, I think, there was about eight or nine guys at this compound that, 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 that they were going to send us after. So they were ID facilitators. So again, it's the same stuff that we're watching on TV. Yeah. And so they call us into the talk. We get, we get our, or they call us into the job. We get our brief. We got our quarterback sleeve. They give us the faces of all these guys, their names and all that stuff. And, uh, and then we head to the ready room to get, to get our stuff. And um, they had declared the area hostile. And, you know, when you declare an area hostile, it's kind of like, you know, the rules of engagement get lowered quite a bit and and on top of that you know these people that you're going after like if you get any of these special operations units whether it's the rangers or the the, the green berets or the marsoc raiders or the seals any of these like if you're going after these guys they're 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 bad dudes you know yeah. so it's yeah. it, um so we load the birds and and we're heading out there and they're normally like on a flight you'll see like a lot of people will try to catch a nap because there's really not much you can do it's not like you can be like on point like pulling security you're in the back of an aircraft you know um, so normally you see guys kind of lean back and, you know, the, the, the humming of the bird and the vibration will kind of put you to sleep a little bit. And on this one, everybody was kind of leaning forward and everybody, you know, and you could just kind of tell looking around like, man, this is like, I didn't know what was taking place in front of me, but I could tell something different was taking place in front of me. And uh, <clears throat> so the six minute call goes off. Everybody starts, you know, with checking our weapons, putting our knives down, checking everything. And then the one minute call happens and then the bird flares. So, you know, the bird flares and now we know, all right, we're directly over, the, we were doing an X landing. So we're directly over the target compound. And as we start our descent, we had two birds going. So we were landing one on the south side and one on the west side, you know, kind of in an L shape. And as we start our descent, the, uh, the mini guns start going off. And we're like, all right, you know, obviously they're, you know, they're, they're firing at us. So, um, so the 160th gunners, they start lighting it up and, uh, and, and we're, we're going down. So once we touch down, the ramp goes down. Um, it was myself and we have, we always had Navy EOD guys attached to us. Um, so it was myself EOD and the second squad squad leader. We were the first ones off the bird. And as, so I, we come off the bird, you know, I'm sitting like my back is against the skin of the aircraft. And then like the, all my Ranger buddies are down to my right. And then the, the, the gunner is down here. And then the ramp is down on this side and the target compound is behind me. So I, I make a left off the bird and then make another left. And now I'm facing the compound. So I'm kind of getting my bearings. You know, I can see these guys, they're running to their like little fighting positions and, and whatever. They had some stuff set up under like donkey carts and jangle trucks and all that stuff. And these like little dugout positions. So I could see them, see the building, and then I can see off to my left, um, uh, third and fourth squad. They're they're getting dropped off over there. So you know, so I can see my left limit, and uh, <clears throat> yeah. So and we just started we just started laying it down, you know, um, and uh, that the, so the, the gunfight went on for maybe about probably about two minutes, and you know everybody we're online. The other bird is online. Plus we got minigun support. So <laughs> what are you going to, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. There's no, you, you have no chance. Um, while this was taking place, a squirter had jetted off uh, out to like the Northeast side of the building. 
so a ceasefire gets called and, you know, so the gun stop and, you know, now we're getting situated. We're figuring out, all right, what just, what just happened, you know, whatever, you know, you're taking that kind of tactical pause before we, you know, we advance onto the compound. And it, on this rotation, we were running two dogs on target. So we had one for squirter chase and we had one for, um, one for assault. So we make our way up to the compound and, and they start, they, they go and they start clearing the building and the platoon sergeant, now, normally when you go on squirter chase, you would have maybe like, like a team plus, like, or a squad minus, maybe going to be like six or seven guys. So it's going to be yourself, the platoon sergeant, uh, a medic, either an FO or a, or a JTAC, or sorry, a, a TAC P, and, and then maybe like a rifleman and a team leader. So you have, you know, you got like six Dang. or seven people who are going to yeah. go out. But they had, a, they had this, you know, all these EKAs that they had to SSE and go clear all these dudes and, and all this stuff. So the platoon sergeant, we had already called a gun run on, on this guy. He was like four or 500 yards away. So we called a gun run in. little birds came in. I think they hit him in the hip and, and the shoulder. And uh, so we weren't like super concerned with him, but we knew he was out there. So we're like, all right, while they're doing their thing, um, SSE and all this, let's go get this, this guy. So me and the platoon sergeant, we head out, I cut the dog off leash and, uh, and the dog gets on odor. He starts making his way, making his way to this guy. <clears throat> and um, so the dog gets on the bite. We catch up to him maybe 20, 30 seconds later. And uh, he, ha he had a weapon. He had a pistol on him. But the dog is kind of thrashing him around where he can't, like, you know, it's out of, out of his hands a little bit. And he's, you know, so when we get up to him, the dog's on him. And... Uh, you know, he's looking up at us and he's saying whatever, you know, whatever he's saying um, in, in Dari or Pashtun or, or whatever. And, um, you know, he, in, in my opinion, it's like, you know, you want to shoot at us. You're going to like, these were big ID facilitators. You're going to go blow up, like you're going to put mines on these roads and, you know, hopefully U S military hits them. But if a civilian hits them, you know, Oh, well, yeah. Um, and then you're going to abandon all your friends while they're, they're over here getting engaged. And you're going to take off running out the back of the building. So to me, it's, and you, and you, you have a weapon and the area is declared hostile and bad timing on your part. You know, this thing just happened back in, in my hometown. Um, so when, you know, when something like that happens, it's, I'm kind of, you know, in my head, like you're not, you, you're not a man. Like at that point you're, you're an animal. Um, so we, we put that guy down and and then made our way back to the, to the target compound we did our sse we got everything that we needed to get and we rtv and on the flight back and again like now this is now i'm starting to go into my reenlistment window and i remember on the flight back i was kind of like at this point i had probably already done like three maybe 300 of these raids not saying that this type of stuff happens every night but i had yeah. you know you're, you're going out night after night after night and at this point i kind of was like again, the war was starting to die down and we just had this significant like emotional event take place. And I kind of, I remember flying back. I was thinking a little bit and definitely when we RTV, I was, I was just kind of like, I think I'm good with the Ranger thing. I think I'm good with the military. I'm good. And that's kind of when I was now heading into my reenlistment window and, and I decided to go enter the contract world. Yeah. Was it tough to make that call? Um, no. No, you just seen enough. Which, which the, they call the call to get out. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yes, because you're leaving. You're leaving something familiar and the security blanket of the military. Yeah. But I kind of, if if I stayed in, I, I don't think I would have gone. I don't think I would have tried out for Delta. But if I did stay in, I might have tried out for RRC. Um. But I don't. I don't know. I, I just. I think I had kind of had drank my fill of the yeah. military at, at this point. Um, What's RRC, and, and just, Patrick? RRC is the regimental reconnaissance company. It's, it's our tier one unit. Um, so it's a, it's a ranger uh, rec reconnaissance unit and, you know, you got to go to selection and all that stuff for that. So I, I might've tried to go do that, but this other opportunity presented itself. And then I ended up working for Raytheon and, you know, they're dangling this big check in front of me. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, at the time I was married and, you know, we were looking at buying houses and all that. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. For sure. Yeah. And 
obviously it turns out to be a great decision, I think is what we'll find out. But yeah. th- this is where we get to the poster behind you, FTP, right? This is kind of the contract you're put on? Yes. Please tell us about this because I, I had not heard of this. I think it's awesome. Yeah, so I had my first, well, just to, to break down the, the um, organizational structure mm-hmm. real quick. So obviously, you know, you have this, you know, 75th range regiment is, you know, direct action raids. And then they had stood up a unit in of the Afghan army called the Katehas, which is basically the Afghan version of the 75th. And they were using contractors and rangers to train these guys. So that was kind of like, that was their version of, of Ranger Regiment. That was the original contract that I got hired to go on was to go train those guys. Well, also over here on the US side of things, you had a program called CST, which again, not many people are familiar with. It's the Cultural Support Team. And it's a, uh, it's a, JSOC, uh, it's a JSOC program of, of women that goes through the selection process to go get attached to Ranger Platoons, SEAL Platoons, and SF Platoons, or SF Teams. And they're there to, um, they get, they have access to information with women and children that we otherwise would have no way, they're not going to talk to us, you know, but they'll talk to to these women, especially once they go through this training and they learn how to to question them and and whatever. So, so JSOC can put this program into place in 2011 was my first introduction to CSTs. They were with us in Kandahar. And then my first introduction to FTPs, which was, you know, the Afghan version of that. Um, my first introduction to them was in 2012 when I was in Salerno. We had an FTP and a CST attached to us. So I knew what they were, but I didn't, I, I didn't, I, when I first went over, I, I actually didn't plan on working with, with, the, with the women at all. I, I went over there to go train the guys and I was with them for about four months. And then the person that was training the FTPs before me, they had stepped down from their contract. They were going to go back to the States and go enjoy their, their life. Position became available. And my program manager approached me and was like, hey, man, we've got this female platoon. Do you want to take over that? And, and uh, so I said, I was like, yeah, let, let me do that. Before we go any further, can you talk about what it was like having a woman in that experience with you before you went to train them, but when you were in the unit? It, when you're in Ranger Battalion and you're downrange and you've got the CST or FTP there, what, what was the dynamic like? Yeah. So in the, my, again, my first, uh, my first experience with them was, in, was in 2011 and I, it, it ended up, I mean, this program ended up being one of the best things to happen, in my opinion, one of the best things to happen to, to the battlefield was introducing these CSTs at the time, you know, all of us, the people at the top obviously knew what they were doing when they set this program up. But when they first got introduced to us, we kind of, and I don't feel bad saying this because it, everything changed, but in the beginning, yep. we kind of looked at them as a liability. We were like, For what, sure. are they doing? what are they doing? You know, but we very quickly learned like, these, not only are they not a liability, they're an asset. These girls yeah. can take care of themselves. They're vetted. They've gone through selection processes. They know what they're doing. And then, you know, there's, there's many, many times where these women have, they've, you know, when we're hitting the target, we're doing our thing with the men and then they've got the women and children isolated off another area. You know, there's a famous example of a uh, second battalion. They had, uh, they had conducted a call out on a building. All the men and women come out and they get them separated. The, the platoon sergeant, the PO and the weapon squad leader talking to the guys, the CST is talking to the women and then they do their leaders, leaders huddle and they figure out, hey, how many people do we have here? And her count of men was different than their count. And it ended up being because there's a barricaded shooter inside that building with a belt-fed weapon waiting for you to walk through the door. And there's, I mean, stuff like that was happening wow. all the time. So we, at the time, you know, we're all being, you know, meathead rangers. We're like, oh, what are these girls doing with us? But we very quickly learned this is one of the best things. When This is one of the best attachments we could have to us. And then, and then same thing. Then, so the FTPs, they were, they were that, but for the Katehas. Got it. Okay. Great context. All right. So you're, so you're downrange training them now, presumably, and kind of working with them day in and day out. How long is that training cycle and what was it like? So pretty much the way that that program worked is we would, 
so we were we were in Kabul at the Kabul Military Training Center, and they have um, that's that's one of I think they do one in Kabul. I think they do one in Kandahar, but they have like two bases where they do like the Afghan National Army like basic training. And that's where all their soldiers go. And then within that basic training, like battalion or whatever it is, they have a female, um, they call them a Kandak. That's like their like company or whatever. Um, there would be like a, a like one female company. So we would go down, every time they would have a graduation, we would go down there with like as recruiters and we would go poach, poach from, from, wow. from down there. And we would go down there with, we'd say, hey, you, you know, do you want to come work with American Special Operations? You're going to be with Afghan special up. You're going to be with the Katehas. Uh, you'll get um, better weapons. You're going to get higher pay. You're going to get English classes. You're going to learn how to drive. You're going to learn how to do airborne operations. You're going to fast rope. You're going to, you know, so you're. How you're, crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, in that context. Wow. Yeah, so it would be, it would be myself. And then there was this, so, so obviously I was like the permanent party. I, I was there for two and a half years. So I'd be the permanent party that was there. And then the CS, there would be a CST, the two CSTs attached to me on, on their deployment cycle. So like every six months, there'd be like two new CSTs over there. So myself and the CSTs, we would go down there and go to these little like recruiting missions. And we would get these girls to come try out for, for this, for this program. So you're going to run them through, you know, they're going to go through a, a PT test, medical screening. Um, we would fly in psychs from Fort Bragg uh, to go do psychological evaluations on them and you know literacy tests and all, and all that stuff and then you know you're gonna you're gonna weed it down to I, I normally like a basic training class of them would be like there'd be like five or six of them it's it's not a lot you know um i think well, like when i first took over the program there was i think there was nine like nine total ftps and they were just constantly on deployment cycles so those girls they were deploying all the time Wow. and then we were we were building the program up more and more um when i left in 2000 and I left in December of 2017 and there was, I think there was maybe like 32 of them when I left. So they had enough where they had an operational group and then they had like a training, a training group. Um, but yeah, we would go down there, recruit them and take them through, put them through like a selection process. And then it would be a, an eight week, like basic special operator course where we would, wow. teach them, yeah, you're going to teach them marksmanship. Um, you're going to teach them all about nighttime operations. You're going to teach them battle drill six, how to clear a building. You're going to teach them um, faster rope insertions, um, flashbangs, grenades, uh, EOD. We had them doing canine work. They're, they're doing all that stuff. And then, you know, you have like an eight week, like crash course to teach them everything because then they're going to go on block leave. And then when they get home from block, or they get back from block leave. They're deploying. They're going to Condus or Kandahar or Bagram or whatever. And we would just repeat that every two or three months. Dang. Would you get to see them again after you sent them out the door? Yeah. Yeah. So th they all, you know, so like it was called Camp Scorpion. So Camp Scorpion was split into two things. You had the American side of Camp Scorpion and then there was the Afghan side of Camp Scorpion. So they had like three strike force platoons that, you know, uh, they had these big buildings that those guys were, would live in. And then they had a separate gated off. Uh, like fenced in area that the, that the women would live in. And w yeah, so when they were operational, obviously I wouldn't see them because they'd be out at their, at their fobs. Um, but then when they would come back from, from deployment, they would come right back to Camp Scorpion and then Dang. they would flip flop. So the girls that were uh, like in a training cycle, it, they were on the same exact training cycle as the Ranger yeah. time. They would come back, they would do an eight month train up. Um, we would run two or three basic training classes, like refresher classes, and then they would go again. And oh. some of those girls did it for years. I mean, some of those girls legitimately have probably been on more targets than I have. They, they I mean, they, like, I think there's two or three of them that they were in that platoon for 10 years and they're doing every eight months, they're going on a rotation. You talked about as you're trying to recruit for that, like, Hey, better pay, you know, working with these, these great units. Was that the motivation for them or was it more, was it also ideological kind of like, I, I couldn't do this if in another world where the Taliban are running it. Like what, where did that come from for them? For some of for them? sure. There was definitely, that was kind of like our hook that we would like use to, to get them, but they all had like a very, you know, like you see a lot of like Americans are patriotic. These like people in, in um, like post like 
in, when, after the fall of the Taliban, like the Afghans over there, they're proud of Afghanistan. You know, they're like, you know, for those 20 years of stability, at least, you know, and women, they don't really get those kind of opportunities over there. So when they saw it, like, all right, it was already a huge obstacle for me to get, not a huge obstacle, but they have to get permission from their family just to join the military to begin sure. with. And then, so they don't even know that this thing exists. And then when they find out it exists, they're like, wait, I can serve in an even greater capacity than I could before. And they had a very, very high sense of like nationalism and duty to their country. And then once you explain the job to them, they're like, okay, we can go out onto the battlefield and uphold like af traditional Af Afghan culture um, with these women that way they're not feeling like, okay, all these American men are coming in here and touching me and doing all this and moving me around. And, you know, so they're like, they're doing, they're, they're, they're very patriotic. And then they're getting to, they get to go like uphold the customs of, of that culture, basically in like a, in a military kind of sense, you know, I don't, I don't know yeah. if I did a good job of explaining that, For but sure. they were, they, they, uh, they took a lot of pride in, in, in that, in that job. What did your relationship with them end up being? I mean, effectively, you're training them like somebody would have trained you to go out the door into some really serious situations. And then you see them coming back. Um, were you able to get, like, develop a, a pretty close yeah. relationship with them? In the beginning, it was a little bit difficult because, you know, they're, they're, they're Afghan women and you're an American. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, yeah. and there's a language barrier, too. Um, some of them speak English, some of them actually speak good English, but a lot of them, it would be either none or broken. Um, but it would generally take like the first group that I got introduced to, it took probably maybe four or five months of everyday interaction before they're like, all right, he's cool. He's not like, you know, he, he's here to do a job. And then, then they would vouch for me when we would recruit these new girls. Cause now these new girls would come in and now the senior girls, they'd be like, Hey, he's good. Don't worry about, you know, don't, you don't gotta be intimidated by this guy. Um, and I ended up having a, a really cool relationship with all of them. I got, I did not expect to stay for two and a half years. My plan when I first took that contract was to go over there, stack some money for like a year and then come home. And I ended up staying for two and a half. I did not want to leave. I loved, I loved that job. Um, uh, wh why is that? Why did you love it so much? I just, I don't know. I kind of like, it, it kind of was like, it sounds kind of cheesy to say, but it's the truth. I felt like I had spent years like engaging in Afghanistan in this capacity. And now this is my chance to, to, to work in Afghanistan in a separate, like, humane like building capacity as opposed to like a the ranger thing you know yeah and it just it was very very rewarding to to like to train these girls up watch them go on target watch them come back and then watch them like just become higher caliber soldiers over and over and then you see this happen every eight months they're coming back and you just get to watch their growth and you know at the time i was probably I'm like 29 at this time. And some of these girls are like 18. So I'm kind of like, you're not like a father figure, but I, you know, I'm like, there's a big age yeah. gap. I'm kind of looking at them like, and I'm like, you know, you're proud. You're like, man, this, you're doing so good. You know? And That's you cool. This. Yeah. And it just, it was a really, really cool position. And those girls, they have, I mean, they were straight up like special operations soldiers, you know? And, and it just made me really, <laughs> really, really proud awesome. to watch that happen. And, uh, I didn't know at the time. So being honest at the time, I, I think I took it for granted a little bit what was actually taking place. I knew that they were the only, you know, female special operations that were there, but I, I like a lot of people thought that Afghanistan was going to turn into this like great place. I don't want to say great place, but I didn't think it was going to end the way it did. And when everything happened last year and I realized like, Oh, it's over. Like this, this whole thing is over that's when it kind of really hit me. Like I had the chance to be a part of something that was like that, that, that was it. They, that was the only platoon that did that. And I just by hand, by, by chance stumbled upon it, you know? And that's when I kind of was like, it really started to hit me the, the, the um, experience that I was able to have. Um, 
So to answer your question, I did. I was able to form a, a great relationship with those girls. I actually went up to Virginia and went and visited some of them a couple of months ago. They're, most of them are back in the States now. Yeah. The evacuation process that took place, um, the CSTs, the, those girls, they are they are fantastic. They did all their paperwork. They, they, uh, they processed a lot of those girls. They got everybody over here. A couple of them didn't make it. Um, but for the most part, everybody, everybody got over and, um, it just, it's so cool to like see them in the States now. Cause they're like <laughs> going to shopping malls and like driving and eating pizza and stuff. And I'm like, you know, when I saw them, you know, when I went to see the, these two at, at this house, they like stuck their head up and I hadn't seen them in like three years at this point, three or four years, and they stick their head out the door and I see them. I'm like, what's up? You know, and they're, and, you know, they're in America and it's, we had always talked about that, but we didn't know if it was ever going to happen. Yeah. So it, it, wow. was, it was cool. That's really neat. So, and you were saying like they, they got pulled out basically probably like six or seven, you know, late 2021, right. They're, they're getting pulled out as things are crumbling August timeframe. Well, yeah. This was happening like right as, as it was all going down, they were, um, the CSTs, they, they had the foresight to start these girls paperwork ahead of time. Once they kind of saw the writing on the wall of what was happening, um, I don't really follow the news too much. I kind of, I just kind of do my own thing. So I knew that we were pulling out of Afghanistan, but I didn't really, I didn't know the extent of how bad it was going to go. And then once I kind of started seeing everything was happening, I started reaching out to the, to some of my friends in the CST community. I was like, Hey, like what's going on? Like what's going on with the girls? Have you heard from them? And they were like, yeah, it's all good. We're, ta we're taking care of this, that, and the other thing. But there's a couple of them we haven't heard from. Um, so, so that was all, I think, I think by the time, um, like when America like officially had pulled out, we had gotten most of them out. There was still one that I personally, that I was still talking to. She was, she was still there. She had actually just had a baby. Um, and she's trying to like get through these like mobs of crowds of people at, at these gates. And we're just relaying information back and forth, you know, so yeah. you see, they would send me aerial, you know, they're sending me aerial uh, pictures of, of the airfield and, you know, that North gate and the Abbey gate and all that. So we're like circling it in red. Then I'm taking a picture of it. I send it to the girl. I'm like, Hey, you need to get to this. Like, if you can get here, we got your paperwork. Like we got you, you're good, but you got to get here. And then, you know, she's trying to fight through crowds of people and she can't get there. So now, okay, let's go try tomorrow. I'm going to go back tomorrow go try again. And you know, this was, and, and a lot of them had this, this kind of the same story where they had to just try day after day after day. And then eventually, cause they all had their, their documents kind of like strapped to their, you know, they had to go through these Taliban checkpoints. So it's all like strapped to their body and to their legs underneath all their clothing. And then when they would get up, if, if they could get at least face to face with, with a NATO soldier at, at these gates and give them their documents, then they were like, all right, Hey, get in, you know, get in. And they, they were able to get in the gate. Um, so this, you know, I have to tip my cat to tip my cap to those CSTs. They did a phenomenal job evacuating those girls out of the country. So what, for the, for the women that you were able to meet again or reunite with here, what kind of work are they trying to find to make a life here? And, and what's their English like now? Presumably after several years, maybe it's gotten better, but I'm sure it's still hard making it here. Yeah, they have, um, a lot of them speak decent English now. Um, there's been, there's been a, a donor that had found out about them that donated a significant amount of money to, to this group of girls. So they've got them up in these apartments. Um, a lot of them are going to school. They're, they're, you know, people have certain people have found out about them and they're paying for their tuition to go, Hey, like I know one of, them is, one of them is trying to get a medical degree. The other one wants to be a teacher. One of them wants to, you know, get her citizenship and join the American military. Um, so they, they, they do have people that are kind of helping them out. Um, but yeah, a lot of them are going to university. Um, and then, yeah, they're, they're working, they're working jobs to try to, to try to pay their way. Um, it is difficult for them. And then especially like, depending on where they get relocated to, you know, you're going to have that, like, depending on the neighborhood that you're in, you might, people might be like, Oh, who are these, you know, these Afghan refugees or whatever. Yeah. And you know, they don't know that this girl over here is, has more than earned more than earned her place it's been rolling know. out with delta on <laughs> yeah exactly, <laughs> on exactly. so Jesus. It's, uh they do they have some challenges right now um and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to talk about them so we can put out some information of how people can help them um but i think that with you know i think that the the 
the JSOC community is going to really rally around them. And, and as, as the war, you know, obviously it's ended now and as more stories start to come out and people start to hear about them, I think more and more people are going to reach yeah. out to them. Their story is going to get out more. And I think that they're going to, you know, get the assistance that they need and that they deserve. This is, this is like movie material right here. This is cool. Story. I for sure think it is. I'm not a movie guy. I don't, I don't want anything to do with that, but I know that, uh, I know that some of these girls for sure would, would, would be interested at least in being advisors to it, you know? Yeah. Um, and again, it's because nobody, nobody knows about them. No. So, um, you had mentioned Patrick, that there is a way for people to support or give money, um, maybe a website. Yep. Where would you point people if they want to get involved here? So there's a, uh, there's a website called sistersofservice.org. And it, it was, again, it was set up by the CSTs. And you can, you, you know, if you log onto that website, it'll kind of give you a breakdown and show you some pictures and kind of tell you all about the FTP program. And it, it does, it has the option if you want to donate money. It's all, you know, it, it, it's an official, it's an official donation website. It's run by, by, these, by these girls, by, by these CSTs. And it, it gets them assistance with clothing, education, housing, all everything that they would need to, to, to resettle. Um, and uh, there's another guy. There's a there's a guy on Instagram. His name is Ben Cantwell. You can see him. Uh, his, his Instagram, I think, is called Ben Cantwell Art or at Ben Cantwell Art. He has a um, he does a lot of like military paintings and stuff like that. And he did one called like the Lioness. I, th- I don't want to correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but I think it's called the lioness of Afghanistan. And he did it, you know, it's, it's, it's for the FTPs. It's like, it's this, uh, it's a, a female lion with the Afghan flag and the American flag and all the proceeds from that, it goes to them. Um, they've got shirts on their website and all that stuff. So there's, there's, there's a couple avenues that people can, can, you can, can go down to, to kind of help these girls with their resettlement. That's great. But specifically, okay. specifically, the, the best one would be the, the Sisters of Service. Okay. And we'll have it in the show notes. So if people want to reference it later, you can just go ahead and click on it and see how you can support. Yeah. One of, them was actually, one of them actually did an interview. This is kind of the first public thing I've seen because um, a lot of them don't want to show their face. And they, you know, a lot of them still have family over there and their families are in jeopardy. You know, the Taliban finds out who these girls are. They don't take kindly to women. You know, they don't take kindly to us kicking in their door. They definitely don't take kindly yeah. to these girls coming in and doing that. So if they can find out who, the, who their families are, that's not going to be, that's not good. So a lot of them do want to stay anonymous, but this one girl, she did, she did come out and she did an interview um, a couple of weeks ago for international women's day. Uh, she did an interview on uh, Politico, right? Politico. Yeah. I yeah. can send you the link and you, you can yep, put it. I saw it. Yeah, I'll, she I'll was kind of talking about it a bit and she's obviously not afraid to have her, her face and information out there, but um, some of them do want to remain anonymous to be. Yeah. Com- completely understand that one. Yeah. And I will say just for those who are listening, I mean, Patrick, you reached out to me and you kind of established the bona fides with, you know, you did five deployments with the Rangers, but the real intent was to share this story. So just for people who are aware, like I kind of had you go through your own experience but I know that you're like the reason you wanted to do this was to talk about them. Yeah, for sure. I um like I'm good. I'm good in my situation. I'm I obviously I'm, I'm living a good life now. But I um that that job I would I think I enjoyed my time as an FTP trainer more than I enjoyed my time in the regiment. Or I should say it was more impactful on my life. Um, and you know when I left, it kind of was like all right, that's my, that's the end of my time. I can't really help these girls anymore. Like I can't just fly to Afghanistan and go help. You know what I mean? But now that they're here, it's kind of like, I get to, I get to, to be, if I can get this interview out and get, you know, get them some exposure, I can keep helping them and, and they deserve it. You know, they, they have put, they have put, like I said, some of these girls have been on more targets than I have. And, um, so, so yeah, to anybody that's listening that, that, that wants to try to help these girls out, go to sistersofservice.org and, um, you know, any, any little bit will help them out. That's awesome. All right. Well, we'll wrap up here in a sec. I got two questions I ask everybody. And since you've listened to these shows, you, you may have heard them, but I, I still want to ask you. And if you know some of these for the FTPs, maybe you could throw those in. But when you were rolling out on target with the Rangers, was there anything that you 
carried with you that had sentimental value, a good luck charm, or something that somebody had given you, you always wanted with you? Um, I, uh, I really, I just, I had a, I was, I was married the whole time that I was in. I just, I had a, I had a picture of, of my wife at the time. I was used to keep it in my breast pocket. Um, it was actually, she'll probably listen to this. And so she might not even know this. I, when we first started seeing each other in like 2010, you know, back then you would like creep on people's Facebook, you know? So like when I first met her, I was like, oh, let me her out on Facebook, you know? And I found this photo of her that was taken before we even met. It was, um, she was at the Crayola factory and she was, you know, there was, I don't know, there was something about this photo where it was just like a really pretty picture of her. And she probably doesn't even know that I had that, but I had printed up, I had printed out a copy of it and I had kind of kept it in, in, uh, it was always in my kit. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. You had taken the Facebook creeping to a next level, printed it out, had <laughs> yeah. it with you. I also <laughs> yeah. had a picture of my wife with me. So like, I, I get it. And actually it was her when she was like four years old. So it was even weirder, but uh, <laughs> anyway, so that's not about me. Yeah. Um, the next part, I think we've, we've kind of touched on it, but I, I love to ask people, you know, especially with everything you went through, not just FTPs, but all those deployments with the Rangers. Um, would you go back and do all that again? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I would say probably it definitely had its challenges. And, you know, I, I had some hiccups when I, when I read, when I, when I was trying to reintegrate back into to life back here, I, I hit some road bumps. Um, but I wouldn't, I don't think I would change anything. Every good thing that I have in my life. Um, you know, obviously I have good parents and all that stuff, but pretty much every, the, the decision I made when I was 21 to join them has paid dividends for me. You know, I'm about, I turned 35 in a couple months and it's just continued to pay dividends for me. I was able to travel the world. I, I have met the greatest people that, that you could have. I'm actually getting ready. I'm going to go to Texas in a couple of weeks and go meet up with a bunch of guys. Some of them I haven't seen in, in eight or nine years. Um, it's the 10th anniversary of one of our, one of our buddies got killed. And so there's a memorial race for him. So I'm going to go oh, wow. guys, from, guys from my platoon. I haven't seen it forever. And these guys, these are people that I never would have had the, the chance to meet before. Um, it, it's, it set me up for success. I got to transition into the contracting world. That was all because of the, the Ranger regiment. Yeah. I got to meet these FTPs and be a part of this, like, you know, historic military uh, platoon of, of the of the um, operation enduring freedom and, and, and the GWAT because of my experience in the Ranger Regiment. Um, so no, I wouldn't change anything. I would do it all over again. I actually, when I meet young guys and they're kind of like drifting in the wind, they're like, I don't know what I want to do. I'm like, you need to join the Ranger Battalion. <laughs> you know? I, I tell them, you know, if it's the right person, I tell it to them. But in yeah, my head, yeah. it's like, oh, you don't know what you're doing? Don't worry, they'll figure it out for you. They'll help you. Yeah. So many. There, there are folks who will write to me who are younger and thinking about a career in the military. And then they'll tell me, Hey, I'm signing up and going to do this. And I'm, I'll often tell them like, I'm so jealous of what you're about to go through. Like certainly there's the Walter Reed angle, which could happen, but I think there's just so much upside in what you experience that you, yeah. like you can't buy it. There's, it's one of the things money can't buy is that experience. It's, it's very, when I was in, I used to always wonder, I'd be like, man, why do these old heads always talk about the military and live their glory days? And now <laughs> I did it. I'm like, of course they do, because it's the best time you're ever going to have. I, I don't want to say ever, but it's yeah. such a, it's such great. a great time, you know? Yeah. So I would, I would absolutely do it all over again. So I, I had just one more question that was in my mind that I wanted to ask you. So you, you spent like all of your time in this elite unit, right? So you didn't kind of go through the picking up rocks. I mean, I know you did basic. I got that. But like, you didn't go through the conventional army side of the house. You, I mean, you were just with the Rangers and then even FTP, which is still like the, the sexy side of the house. Do you, do you feel like you relate with the regular army in, in some way or is it different for you? Um, yes and no. I relate to them in the sense that I, I understand that I had, now, again, I had it really hard. You know, they're going to, they're going to torture you in the beginning. So I had it really hard, but I, I realized how good I actually had it. You know, like we always had, 
it's it's hard for me to relate to them in the sense that like no i'm not living in this like living in these dirty austere conditions like we always had our own rooms with a fridge and a tv and we we're living in gucci life you know <laughs> and everything was always like set up for us we were good so i can't relate to them in that sense but i actually after i've gotten out and i've met more of those people because you don't really have any any interaction with those right. guys um but as i've met more and more of them I think those guys, like to, to circle back to when I was first joining, I actually think those guys deliver deserve a lot more credit than they get. You know, the the your elite units, they kind of get like all the sexy press and the movies and all that stuff. But like in my opinion, what those guys do is way more dangerous than than the stuff that we were doing. We were handpicking our targets, we're rolling in with the 160th, we got the best gear, we got we have everything on our side. And you know, where those guys they're going out in broad daylight in, yeah. you know what I mean? I, Patrolling. I'm, yeah. Looking for just waiting to get shot at. And I'm like, yeah. That's, that is to me, those guys are, they deserve way more credit or like, or, okay. For example, like, like a military police, if you're at, you know, say you're running an ECP, that job would terrify me. But to me, that's way more dangerous than, than what I did where, you know, you're running an ECP and somebody could just drive a bomb right up to you and you have nothing you can do about it. You know? Yeah. Um, so as I've gotten out and I've met more and more people that I didn't have access to before, um, I'm relating with people better, but when you're in, when you're in, yeah, there is kind of a culture of like, stay away from those guys, you know? Yeah. That's just, I don't know. That's just kind of how they, they do it. Yeah. No, I, I assume that was the case. And, and I should have said, like, I know you went through basic just like everyone did. So you, you still got that experience. It's just more, I think like for those of us who were on the conventional side and we look over it. Uh, they got the compound over there and the the cool stuff. I, I just didn't know how you'd relate to to those folks. It makes total sense. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Patrick, this has been so much fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for reaching out, and we'll have links here so folks can help out the uh, the FTP as as they're back here in the states and making a new life for themselves. So thanks so much for the time, man. Right on, man. I really appreciate you having me. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, like, like, like you said, hopefully we can uh, we can make some positive, uh, positive impact on, on uh, these women's lives. So thank you again for having me. This this is great. And I'm going to I'm going to share and, and, and uh, push your push your page and your YouTube to everybody I know. And, you know, we're, we're going to try to get those subscribers up to 100,000. <laughs> appreciate it, brother. Appreciate yeah, it. You're the man. We'll get a beer sometime. Absolutely. The next time you're in Tampa, man, I'm like I said, I'm two hours south. Yeah, dude. We'll do it. We'll do it. Our first comment is from YouTube on the Carl Erickson interview, and it's from Benjamin Kerfman. He says, thank you for these interviews. As a senior in high school, it's really inspiring to listen to the stories from these men. I would just say thanks, uh, Ben, for listening. These are important to hear. I wish I had heard or sought out more of these when I was younger to help me uh, make better decisions as I was as I was in the similar situations to these folks. So thank you for listening. Thanks for leaving that comment and good luck in what, whatever's ahead for you as a high school senior. Our second comment is both a comment and a question left on YouTube in response to the Bill Oastland interview. And this is from Eric Bright. It says, another great interview with an amazing leader and warrior. I've watched every episode of Combat Story and look forward to my Saturday evening cup of joe while watching a new episode every week. It's great stuff. In a side note, a question for you, Ryan. I've noticed that while watching your shows that you have either a tick or habit of keeping your right eye somewhat open while blinking. Is this just something that you've always done since childhood or was this developed over your time as an Apache pilot while using the right eye for the lens on your flight helmet? Again, thanks for the awesome content and God bless. Hey, it's a great question. Um, my wife has known me since we were 15 years old and she is quick to point out that I have way too many ticks and habits like this. I, w I think this may have been one that came out of my time flying, but I don't think everybody has it. Uh, maybe it was just me. I certainly haven't flown as long as a lot of these guys and gals. Um, but yeah, I've, I've definitely got some ticks and I think a lot of them come from my time downrange. Anyway, um, keen eye there. Eric, uh, and thank you very much for being such a dedicated supporter and listener. I, I appreciate having folks who tune in every week and get some something out of these shows from the people who take the time to 